Today we're going to be designing Tinder. And so Tinder may seem straightforward at first glance, given it's a simple user interface. You know, a user creates a profile, they swipe left or right on other profiles, and if two users swipe right, a match is made. However, as former CTO of Tinder, Maria Zhang described it, Tinder is like an iceberg. All of the complexity is hidden beneath the surface. And as we dive deeper into the system design behind Tinder, you'll begin to understand why this complexity exists and why the challenges of building such a platform are far, are far more intricate than they might initially appear. So let's jump into the requirements. For the functional requirements, users should be able to create and manage their profiles, including uploading photos, writing a bio, and specifying their preferences. There should also be location-based recommendations so that users' recommendations are based on their current location, ensuring relevance and proximity. There should also be preference settings so that users should have the ability to customize their search preferences, such as a desired search radius, age range, and other filters to refine recommendations. We'll also have a matching mechanism so this matching algorithm will allow users to swipe left, so dislike or right like on profiles, and then with a match occurring when both users swipe right. And then we also want to be able to handle passport mode. So we want to provide a feature that allows users to change their location and receive recommendations from different geographical areas, enabling interactions with users in other cities and countries. And for the non-functional requirements, scalability is huge. So this platform must be able to handle millions of users simultaneously and scaling efficiently as the user base grows and as usage spikes in specific regions at specific times. We also want availability. So the system should maintain high availability, ensuring that users can access the service without interruptions, even during peak times. And then finally, we want low latency. So user interactions such as swiping and loading profiles should be smooth and responsive with minimal delay to maintain an engaging user experience. And what we're not covering here is the chat functionality. Um, so when two users match, they will be able to chat. However, we've discussed this in detail in our messaging app system design. So that will be linked in the description if you want to check that out. And so as always, I think the best way to understand this system design is to walk through some of the main flows of the application. And then hopefully when we've done that, we'll really understand how this whole system works as a unit. So the first flow we're going to look at is the creating a profile flow. So the first step is a user will initiate the profile creation process by sending a post request to the profile API endpoint. And this process can be divided into multiple post requests, each handling specific aspects of the profile, for example, basic information, preferences, and image uploads. And so this modular approach ensures that each component of the profile is processed independently, allowing for better error handling and data consistency. The Tinder API gateway, the tag, so this will then route the incoming HTTP requests to the appropriate backend services. And so in this case, it will be the user profile service. So uh, the Tinder API gateway also performs several other functions, including rate limiting, session management, and bot detection, and request and response scanning. And for the technical interview, you won't have to go into more detail than this, but if you want to learn more about Tinder's API gateway, there's a great uh, tech blog post by the Tinder team that's also linked in the description. So once the request is routed to the user profile service, the user's images are then uploaded to an object storage, such as Amazon S3, and this storage solution is ideal due to its scalability, durability, and ease of integration. The images are then distributed via content delivery network, a CDN, to ensure that they are delivered quickly and reliably to users across the globe. And so a CDN reduces latency by caching images and servers close to the user's location, improving the overall user experience. The user's basic information and preferences are then stored in the user profile database. And so DynamoDB is a great choice here due to its high scalability and low latency, which is essential to meet Tinder's large scale and performance requirements. And then finally, the user's location information, such as its latitude and longitude, as well as its preferences, are then sent to the location service for indexing. And so Elasticsearch will be used to implement searching for users because it's highly scalable, provides powerful full text search capabilities, and supports real time querying. So given that Tinder is a location-based service with a maximum search radius of 100 miles, it is inefficient to include distant users, say a user in London, when serving a user in California. And so storing all users in a single global index would lead to significant performance issues due to the large index size and the computational load required to process queries. Therefore, to handle Tinder scale, which involves millions of users, we will use a geographically optimized solution known as geosharding. And this approach involves storing users who are physically near each other within the same shard. And so by reducing the index size that each query needs to search, geosharding significantly improves query performance and minimizes computational overhead. 
And so the challenge with geosharding is that we want to ensure that the load is balanced across shards, avoiding the creation of a hot shard where certain shards become overwhelmed with data or queries. In practical terms, as shown in the image, there won't be any users in cells over the ocean. However, large cities like New York or London may have millions of users within small geographic areas. And so to manage this, our service will have to calculate a load score for each shard. And we can use factors such as user activity and density to ensure that the distribution of users across shards remains balanced. And so to implement geosharding, the system will leverage Google's S2 library, which is also what Tinder uses. And this under the hood uses a Hilbert curve to preserve spatial locality. And so a Hilbert curve is a type of space filling curve that ensures the points that are close on the curve are also close in physical space, making it ideal for mapping geographic data in a way that maintains locality. And so what the S2 library does is it then projects the Earth's surface onto a cube where each face of the cube is then filled with a Hilbert curve and subdivides it into cells, with each cell representing a specific geographic area. These cells are organized into a quadri structure where four smaller cells will combine to form a larger cell. And by adjusting the size of these cells, the system creates geo shards that are tailored to balance load and performance effectively. For example, in densely populated areas, smaller cells and the smaller geo shards are used to ensure that the load is evenly distributed. Each user is mapped to an S2 cell based on their location, so their latitude and longitude, and these cells are then grouped into geo shards. And so when a query is made, uh, such as a user searching for recommendations within a 100 mile radius, the system will first determine which S2 cell fall within the search area. So we'll have the user latitude and longitude, and we can then have the search area. And so within that radius, we can then calculate all the S2 cells. And then these cells are then mapped to the corresponding geo shards. So we've got our query radius, then we've got an S2 cell, and then we've got our geo shard. And so by querying only the relevant geo shards, the system optimizes search performance and minimizes unnecessary computation. So in this example, there'll only be three geo shards. We'll have one, two, and then three for this search radius, which is far more efficient than querying all of the geo shards. And so in summary, it's this use of S2 cells and geo shards that allow you to be able to look up other users for recommendations. And so once the location service calculates the S2 cell that user belongs to, it'll then send that message to Kafka. Kafka ensures strict message ordering, which is crucial for maintaining consistency in location updates, which will be discussed in depth below in the updating location flow. The workers will then pull messages from Kafka and then query the mapping cache, which in this case can be Redis, to determine the geo shard corresponding to that S2 cell. So Redis is preferred here because the mapping is infrequently updated, making it ideal for caching purposes. And then finally, the worker then can create the user document in the correct geo shard, ensuring that the user's profile is accurately stored and indexed based on their location. So this is probably the most complicated flow, but if you can understand the geo sharding technique, that's probably the most complex thing to understand in this whole system architecture. So the next flow we're going to look at is the swiping flow. So for instance, a user will perform a swipe action in the Tinder app, and then this action is then sent through an established WebSocket connection. So the Tinder API gateway, again, it will manage the WebSocket connection for all active users, and it'll also handle authentication and initial connection setup. And so once that WebSocket connection is, is established, the Tinder API gateway will then route that swipe action to the appropriate backend service for processing. And so the WebSocket server will then receive the swipe actions directly from users through that established WebSocket connection. It'll then push that information onto the swipe queue, which can be implemented with Kafka for asynchronous processing. And it will also ensure that actions are handled in the order they are received. The WebSocket server will also keep that WebSocket connection open with active users, enabling bi-directional communication for real-time notifications, uh, which is really important to make sure we're giving our users a great user experience. So the swipe queue will temporarily hold all incoming swipe actions, providing a buffer that helps manage load and ensure that the swipe actions are processed in a scalable and efficient manner. Workers will then pull those messages off the swipe queue for processing, and the swipe information is then stored in the swipe database, ensuring that all actions are persisted for future reference. If the swipe is a like, so a right swipe, then it is stored in the likes cache, which again can be implemented with Redis for quick access. And it'll also check if the other user had previously swiped right, so liked the current user. And so if it is a match, then we will push a notification onto the notifications queue. This queue holds match notifications, ensuring that they are processed in the correct order and delivered reliably. The match notification service will then pull that notification off the notification queue and then it'll then send that match information back into the WebSocket server, which then communicates the match details to the user via the open WebSocket connection, 
providing that real-time feedback and great user experience. The next flow is the generating recommendations flow. So again, the user requests to get the recommendations by sending a GET request to the recommendations API endpoint. And this request includes parameters such as the user's current location and desired search radius. The Tinder API gateway will then route that HTTP request to the appropriate backend service. So here will be the recommendation service. The recommendation service will first send a request to the location service to determine the user's current location and the corresponding geographic cell, so the S2 cells based on the user's location and desired search radius. The location service will then query the mapping cache to get the corresponding geo shards for the calculated S2 cells. If there's a cache miss, it will then query the mapping database and update the mapping cache accordingly. Once the appropriate geo shards are identified, the recommendation service can then query Elasticsearch where the geo shards are stored. And then simultaneously, the recommendation service can make a request to the swipe database to fetch a list of profiles that the user has already swiped on. And to enhance performance, the swipe cache may also be utilized to quickly retrieve recent swipe actions without querying the main database. And then after filtering final list, because again, we don't want to send profiles to a user who they've already swiped on, this filtered list is then compiled and then sent back to the user via the API gateway. And then for the final flow, we are going to discuss the updating location flow. And so this, for example, could be if a user moves or if they choose to use passport mode. So the user requests to update their location by sending a put request to the location API endpoint. The Tinder API gateway will then route that incoming HTTP request to the location service. And the request will include both the user's current location and the new location with which they want to move to. The location service will calculate the S2 cell the user is currently in, as well as the S2 cell corresponding to the user's updated location. The S2 calculation is critical for identifying the geographic region in which the user should, should now be indexed. And so to manage consistency within Tinder's geosharded architecture, the location service will then push a message onto a Kafka queue. So Kafka is used to ensure scalability, ordered message processing, which is crucial for maintaining consistency when a user's location changes rapidly or when there are concurrent updates. So Kafka ensures that documents with the same keys, so for example, the user IDs, are consistently sent to the same partitions, maintaining the order of updates and preventing inconsistencies that could, could arise from out of order processing. So workers will then pull that message off Kafka queue and process the location index. So they will get the geo shards from the mapping database. They will subsequently then remove the user's documents from the old geo shard and add a new document to the new geo shard where the user is now located. And so this is the complete architecture. Again, I like to keep it all in one image so that you can have a mental snapshot of it. But again, hopefully it should be easier to understand now that we've gone through each of the, the main flows individually. And then finally, for additional discussion points, you could discuss error handling and retry. So retry mechanisms like implementing retries for failed Kafka operations and database writes to handle transient issues, as well as dead letter queues for messages that fail repeatedly, preventing them from blocking other processes. And then also maybe scaling and load balancing. So you could have auto scaling the WebSocket servers, the workers and the match notification service based on demand. We could also have load balancing. So to distribute the WebSocket connections and service requests evenly across service to prevent overload, as well as database scaling. So using partitioning, sharding and read replicas for horizontal scaling and improved performance. And then finally, we, we should also think about maybe data privacy and compliance. So ensure GDPR or CCPA compliance. We want to anonymize data and use encryption for security. So again, I hope this video was helpful. If you want to see the full write-up, it's over at techprep.app and hopefully I will see you in the next one.